tonight is, lect is lesson seven. It's Aristotle on happiness. Which do you think seems happier? I'm gonna give two cases for a number of different animals. And I'm gonna ask you which one seems happier, all right? And I want you to each give me your answer in turn, right? A horse in a stable or a horse running around a racetrack? Which do you think is happier? Dog in a kennel or a dog licking its master? Next one, a cat in the pound where all the unclaimed animals are or a cat catching a mouse? And the last one is a human sitting in a room by himself staring at the walls or a human discovering the cure for cancer. So what do all these cases have in common that's the happier animal over the uh, less happy animal? Which one's more fulfilling the potential? The one that's um, not doing anything or doing things that they're kind of like you said, they're supposed to do, they're made to do, right? They're fulfilling their natural function. So Aristotle, who we're studying tonight, he thinks of happiness as in terms of these excellent activities that these creatures are doing that are fulfilling their nature. And for instance, what do you think is a plant that's happier? A plant that's wilted and drying up or a plant that's blooming with a big flower? That's what happiness is. It's the bloom of each thing that's being what it is. It's becoming what it really is. So when the flower is blooming, it's becoming total flowerhood. Like it's actualizing its flower potential versus when it's kind of drooping and dying, right? And he says that for every living organism, it has this purpose or function that nature is giving it. And when it fulfills that function, that's its happiness, right? Now, when you fulfill your happiness, if you're a flower or a horse or a cat or a dog or an eagle or a human, it might give you a good feeling, but happiness is not just the feeling, it's fulfilling the, the function. Yeah. So let's stop here and I just wanna say, couple of things about Aristotle before we jump in and then I'm gonna outline what we're gonna talk about tonight. There's a writer named Charles Murray who's sort of controversial because he's um, written some books on race and IQ and intelligence, which are, are kind of controversial. Um, but he wrote a book called Human Achievement and he set out there to measure who are the most in, uh, influential people in history by their ideas, their discoveries, their inventions, and who influenced human knowledge more than anyone else. And Charles Murray concluded that Aristotle was the most influential person who ever lived. In other words, he mattered more than any other person. He's basically the most important person who ever lived because of his influence on what came after. So the idea of science, the idea of knowledge in, that pursued in a scientific way, um, the idea of the university, many, many things come from Aristotle. He's known as the most difficult philosopher one of the reasons is that we only have lecture notes from his students, right? So if you ever know your own lecture notes, they might not make sense to someone other than you, especially if you're in a hurry, right? So you can imagine someone's lecture notes from 2,500 years ago um, is all we have of, of Aristotle, but um, we do the best we can. There's one other German philosopher named Immanuel Kant, as in the Monty Python song, right? Immanuel Kant was a real pissant. It was very rarely stable. Well, he's considered also very, very difficult. So don't feel bad if some of it you're struggling with. Tonight, we're gonna to first talk about Aristotle's idea of happiness, which we started getting into. Then we're gonna get into his idea of how you form an excellent character, especially through habit, the role of excellence as being habits, right? It's not just doing it once, but it's doing it as a habit that makes uh, a character trait excellent or that makes for excellent character traits. Then an extremely important thing, we're gonna talk about Aristotle's view of choice or, or free will. And especially this one sentence that I think is extremely important and explains all the differences between conservatives and liberals, between progressives and you know people on the right wing or the left wing between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, right? It's this one sentence. Man remains always the moving principle of his own actions. And that's a very important sentence. And it divides people up politically, whether you agree with that or disagree with that, okay? Um, and I think that that's what we're gonna focus on for tonight, okay? But before we do all that, I'd like for you to look at the part of the reading tonight that gives the epigrams. And I just wanna highlight a few of the most important ones of these um, that you should remember, okay? Number one, you must 
Honor the truth above all things, even our friends. Extremely important. And in this sentence, he happens to be talking about Plato. He's saying, you know, I disagree with my teacher Plato, but we must honor the truth above all things, even our friends. And even that can make it difficult sometimes. That doesn't mean you have to be rude in speaking the truth. That doesn't mean you always have to speak the truth when it's not your turn. But in the end, in terms of what you believe, um, you have to honor the truth. The rain does not fall so that the crops may grow, but of necessity. Now, I would point out that to me that contrasts with the statement that Theseus gives in the suppliant, suppliant women, where he says, the earth itself gives us fruit to eat, water drops from heaven to quench our thirst and nourish the yield of the land. So Theseus is there implying that, oh, the rain falls so that we can have something to drink and our crops will grow. And Aristotle's saying, it's not, it doesn't work like that. The human, uh, the, the universe doesn't care about you. The universe doesn't know about you. The rain is not falling so that your crops will grow. The rain is falling because it has to, right? So that was new for, for a lot of people. They were like, you mean the gods aren't up there taking care of us? Uh, then we must habituate ourselves to true pleasures. That's very important, especially in education and in raising children, if any of you ever have children you will see that you want to get them taking pleasure in the right things. If they take pleasure in things which aren't good for them, that'll be a problem because then they'll have bad habits, right? Um, just two more that we're going to read. That's going to come back again and again and again and again, this idea that Man stands upright, erect, dignified, unlike the other animals who crawl around or on all fours. Man, certainly the only primate who stands up. And the idea is he's upright so that he can look toward heaven and, and manifest his divine nature. This is extremely important in the Renaissance and its idea of the dignity of man. And in ancient Rome, you'll hear it a lot within these philosophers who think that man should um, actualize his divine potential. So that idea will look for it in the readings ahead, that man stands erect because of his godlike nature. So the idea is man is either the best or the worst thing in the world. Because of his powers, if he uses them for good, he can be a billion times better than the next best thing. But if he uses his powers for evil, like Hitler, right, or Stalin or one of these dictators, he can just kill millions and millions of people. And he's a billion times worse than the next worst thing. So that's one of the interesting things about man is his potential for improvement, for improving the world, for making the world a better place, or for blowing up the whole planet, right? And just making a complete mess of things. And one of the greatest mysteries is man's inhumanity to man. How can people do things like torture each other, kill, you know, slaughter, all this kind of stuff, it boggles the mind when you study the amount of evil that's been done. But it also boggles the mind when you think about how much we know and how much we've been able to improve our lives, even in the last hundred years. You wouldn't be able to live a hundred years ago. You wouldn't believe all the things that you don't have. So um, that's one of the great interesting things about studying mankind is that we're the best and the worst. So now we're going to go on to Aristotle's view of happiness. Very, very important. We talked about the flower metaphor. Um, the idea, happiness, Aristotle is uses this word eudaimonia. And we talked, remember, what does EU mean if you put it in front of a word? It means good, right? So, uh, and then daimon, what's a daimon? It means spirit. So eudaimonia means what? Good spirit, right? So the good spirit of a thing is when it does an excellent activity, and that's its goodness of spirit, okay? So he says... What's the object of life? What's the meaning of, of life? What's the, what is the, he says, what we want to figure out is what does everybody really want? Okay. And he says in the end, both philosophers and ordinary people think that the highest good, that's what everyone should want to have is happiness. And they identify happiness with, you know, living well and doing well. Okay. But he says that people, different people define happiness different ways. So because they define happiness in different ways, that's where philosophers get involved and they're gonna say, well, what is happiness? Now, Aristotle says happiness is an activity. 
that we covered that, and that's very important. But he says, um, we need to dig down on this. And he says, what kind of activity? What's the unique human activity? So humans must have some unique function beyond just eating and growing. We can see and hear things, touch and smell, but so can the horse and the ox and other animals. They can also do these things. So he says, if you eliminate everything else, there's one thing that humans can do, and that's have an active life of reason, because no other animal or any other creature or anything can do that. So that's where he says, man, the rational animal. Very famous. He says, we can call the life of reason the goal of man. It's his excellence, his happiness, his good. Most simply, we can call happiness excellent thinking. But to him, that's the happiest you can possibly, possibly be is to do excellent thinking. And he quickly says, though, but we must add, over the course of a lifetime, for one warm day does not make a summer. So too, one moment does not make a man blessed or happy. So he's talking about values pursued and achieved, excellences pursued and achieved over the course of a lifetime as a pattern, as a habit, not just once or twice or on Tuesdays and Thursdays, right? So that's his idea. You're doing things on principle. The kind of person you are determined by the kinds of things you do because of the habits you have. So the role of habit. He says, men become builders by building and flute players by playing the flute. So too we become just by doing just acts, temperate by temperate acts, and brave by brave acts. So he's saying that you are what you do. So, um, you become good by doing good things. You become brave by doing brave acts. Right? Now, that's, that's different than what we're usually taught to think about. He, he's saying you are what you do. It's a whole philosophy based on activity. And then if you go to the bottom of that paragraph, he says, the kinds of habits we form when young make a huge difference, or rather, all the difference. So he's really, 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 really big on developing the right kind of habits when you're little. Because he goes on to say, um, and we're going to get to this in the training for excellence, that um, if it's almost impossible to correct someone who has a lifetime of bad habits. And this is why conservatives are very skeptical. Uh, in certain ways, Aristotle was the first conservative. Conservatives are very skeptical that just by throwing money at poor people, you'll change their lives, right? Because the conservative point of view is many of these people are poor for a reason. They're poor because they have a lifetime of bad habits going back generations. They don't know anyone in their family who's ever had a job, right? Everyone as far back as they know has either been in, on welfare or in prison. And, and in their neighborhoods, they, people make fun of people who have jobs, okay? So the whole culture has bad habits. So the idea you just throw money at them and give them a place to live and give them free food and stuff is gonna change their, change their habits, make them excellent. And Aristotelian would say, no, you have to get in there very early and actually kind of change their values and their modeling and stuff like that. And, you know, some people on the left would agree. And they say that's why, you know, um, there should be more role models in the media and more, more people of color in television shows and so on and so forth so that these people can have different role models, right? So you can take Aristotle and turn him in a progressive way too, if you're interested in that. Um, so I'm, it's, I don't want, mean to say that he's politically only on one side necessarily. As the fable of Gyges ring suggests, most people do not abstain from bad acts from nobility of soul, but from fear of punishment, okay? So he seems to be kind of agreeing with what Glaucon says there. He doesn't mean, say that there's um, no way to be good, but he says fear of punishment is helpful in, in uh, teaching people what to do. And he says, um, uh, most people living by their emotions pursue mere pleasures. They don't have a conception of true happiness since they've never tasted it, right? So how can you teach these people who have never tasted excellent activity what that excellent activity would be? It's almost like trying to describe the color purple to a blind person. If they've never seen the color, how could they imagine purple or black or white or green or gray or anything, right? Aristotle's kind of saying that. He's saying, what argument would remold such people? We will find it hard, if not impossible, to remove by argument traits long ingrained in character. 
But the soul of the student we must first cultivate by means of habits for noble joy and noble hatred, just like we mulch and hoe the earth to nourish the seed. So he's saying we have to teach people when they're young to hate the right things and love the right things so that your emotions will go with the character of excellence, not against the character of excellence. So let's say that, you know, from an early age, you learn to hate all the wrong things. Like everything that was good for you, you were taught to hate and be afraid of. And everything that was bad for you, you were taught to like. It's like, oh, poison's really good for you. And, oh, you know, it's really bad for you to like wash your hands and be clean. And, and then you develop this whole set of emotions. If you did that, you wouldn't last very long, right? Because you'd be constantly working against your emotions to try and do the right thing. So he's saying uh, as parents and as educators, one of the most important things you have to do is to uh, manipulate the emotions at an early stage so that people get the right emotional habits, okay? Um, and he's saying, unfortunately, in his time, ancient Greece, uh, the societies didn't do this. He said the only state that really did it was Sparta. And I think if any of you ever studied Athens versus Sparta in school, you'll remember that the Spartans were very strict in terms of trying to make their young soldiers tough. So they made them take cold showers when they were three years old and they did all this stuff, but then they turned out to be excellent warriors and they fulfilled their function in that society. And Aristotle makes the point that without some kind of system of education, whether it's just the family um, making an attempt or whether it's a society or a church or a religion or something, he says without that, each man lives as he pleases Cyclops fashion, dictating his own law to his own wife and children. Does anyone have an idea why he might have said that without these good habits, we live like the Cyclops? Does anyone remember how the Cyclops, were, their society was kind of described? It's basically Homer says they had no civilization, right? And so the civilization begins with how we raise our young people. And societies which don't raise their young people correctly and all the women are pregnant by 12 and all the men are in jail by 14, it's because they're, they're basically cyclopses. You know, they're, they're uncivilized, okay? And so the idea is if you live that way, you're not really, you're not as you could become if you taught um, your young people to kind of take pleasure in the right things and, and if you raise them correctly, okay? Now let's go on to... Um, Using excellence. This is very important because Aristotle says that we have to choose something for it to be good. And he says that we choose to do something reveals our character even more than our actually doing it. Now, considering that we've talked about how excellence is an activity and everything in Aristotle is an, about activity, it is even more important than activity making us what we are. The habit of the thing is the choosing. He says, that's really what shows us what we are. It's our choices that really reveal who we are. So choice is a controversial idea in philosophy. Many philosophers today believe that we have no choice and we're determined to do everything we do like robots. Basically, everything external acts upon us. Race, class, gender, all these external categories, poverty, you know, privilege, microaggressions, there's all these external things and they make us do what we do. They make us choose, right? Aristotle says that's all nonsense. Everything that happens to you that you do, you choose to do, right? Now, maybe you're choosing to do it because someone puts a gun to your head and says, do this or else, but you're still choosing it and you can either choose to get killed or you can choose to comply, right? So even though they're forcing you, you're still making a choice. Someone would say, oh, liberals often say this, there's no freedom on an empty stomach. Poor people have no freedom. Well, there is freedom on an empty stomach because people go on hunger strikes and actually die, like political prisoners in Russia or whatever, if they want to protest, they go on a hunger strike. And they still have freedom to eat or not eat. You know? So the idea that you, know, you can't have freedom on an empty stomach is, is not true, but people often say that. Um, but I'm interested here in Aristotle's emphasis on choice because it's so unique to him, man remains always the moving principle of his own actions. So now most uh, legal theory, or if you become a lawyer and you want to prosecute criminals, right, put them in jail, 
all of the theory about how responsible you are for your own actions kind of comes from this Aristotelian idea. So you have to have a certain amount of knowledge um, or and you're also responsible for not knowing uh, in most cases um, what you were doing. Like you got drunk, you're responsible for being drunk, right? No one said you had to get drunk and get behind the wheel of a car, right? So this idea that we're, we're the different, assessing different um, states of responsibility and states of knowledge, very important to legal theory, very important if you ever become a lawyer and you're arguing a case in court, it will all be based on basically these ideas in these two paragraphs. If you get drunk, he says, he says they actually double penalties in the case of drunkenness in ancient Greece. The moving principle remains in the man himself, since he had the power of not getting drunk, and getting drunk caused his ignorance, right? So you caused yourself to be drunk, and then the drunkenness caused the ignorance, therefore you cause your own ignorance. Does that make sense? Are we figuring that out? You're responsible because of the way, the kind of life that you live. So eventually you degrade yourself so that you can't really tell right from wrong. But he's like, no one's making you go spending your life gambling, gaming, right? Engaging with all these activities. Today we might say people spend their lives video gaming or being online or doing all this kind of stuff. It's like nobody's making you do that. But if you do that all the time, you will turn yourself into a different kind of person than you would be if you were doing other things. Your activities and your habits will eventually mold you and change you and you will become a different person and eventually the rest of society won't be able to reach you anymore, right? So when you see homeless people in the streets of New York City, they're sleeping in their own urine and feces, okay? They're eating out of garbage cans, right? That doesn't, you just don't get up one morning on, from your apartment on Park Avenue and walk to the corner and decide to become homeless and start eating out of a garbage can, right? There's a whole long, a whole long line of bad decisions over years and years and years and years that lead you to be there, right? So, but when liberals say, oh, homelessness, as if it's just something that dropped from the heavens and has nothing to do with the people's behavior, an Aristotelian would say, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try to help these people, but we must honor the truth of, ahead of all things, even political correctness or our friends or anything else, right? So we have to speak the truth is that in many, most of these cases, people have a lot of bad habits, which would put them in a bad situation. And if then we can call our excellences voluntary, we must call our defects voluntary too. Another extremely important idea, right? Because you'll hear people Oh, they didn't have the same chances you had, right? So they didn't succeed because they weren't as privileged, okay? But think about that. When people do succeed, are they responsible? When LeBron James trains every day super, super hard from the time he's like four and then becomes the best basketball player ever and he doesn't let his background hold him back, is he responsible for that when he succeeds? You can't say he's responsible and praise him when he succeeds but then say, say he's not responsible just when he fails? That doesn't make any sense. There are black billionaires. Are they responsible for being billionaires? So Aristotle's saying, let's be consistent. Either we're responsible for what we do or we're not responsible for what we do. You can't just say, oh, the successful people are responsible, but the unsuccessful people are not responsible, right? You see what he's saying? People choose to be excellent voluntarily and they choose to be vicious voluntarily. He says, if then we can call our excellence as voluntary, we must call our defects voluntary too. There's two kinds of justice that Aristotle believes in, and this is an influential idea. It will come up under Thomas Aquinas. It will come up if you ever study uh, philosophy or political science. Two types of justice, right? Uh, there's a type of justice called distributive, and there's a type of justice called retributive. Retribution is vengeance, okay? So justice as vengeance Basically, it's like getting the bad guys, putting them in jail, and giving them a punishment to pay back the evil they did, right? So if you hang a murderer or put them in, execute a murderer, that's retributive justice. You're taking retribution or vengeance. Distributive justice 
involves giving everyone what they're due. For instance, uh, to give women voting rights when women couldn't vote, the movement to, for women's suffrage um, so that women could vote was distributive justice, giving them the rights which they're owed by their position in society. The current wokeness and political correctness, it talks about uh, making sure there's more black people at Harvard or whatever, um, that's distributive justice. There should be as many uh, a percentage of black people in Hollywood as exist black people on the streets of the United States, right? Distributive justice, right? Oh, there's you know, Hollywood so white was a hashtag they had on Twitter, right? There shouldn't be more whites in Hollywood in the business than there are whites in the country. Distributive justice. Aristotle says distributive justice involves proportion, right? So those are, those are two different kinds of justice. When they talk about um, reparations for slavery, they're not talking about punishing white people by taking their money and giving it to black people. They're talking about distributive justice, compensating um, uh, families of black people who, who were slaves with their liberty taken from them, right? So that should be clear. Um, one last point where he says the rule of law, he says, we do not allow a man to rule, but a rational principle. Because a man behaves thus in his own interest and becomes a tyrant. So. The idea is rules should control the society. The constitution should control the society, not what Donald Trump or Joe Biden uh, wakes up and feels like doing that day, right? So the constitution uh, more than people is but a good society is what rules. So we say in the United States, a government of laws and not men. That's basically Aristotle was the one who came up with that idea. And you'll hear that discussed a lot, especially by conservatives who believe in constitutional government. Last point I wanna make is under that natural law and state law, this idea of a natural law, which we first found in Heraclitus, where he said, um, we have to have political unity by that which we all share. We all share reason, we all share law. This idea of natural law that we don't create, but we discover, that's very important. It will come up again and again and again in uh, when we get to Rome at the end of this week and for the next week after that. I'm just gonna read the sentence there. It says, natural law everywhere has the same force and does not exist by people thinking this or that. State law, however, does exist. We create it and it's what people think, right? There's this idea of natural law that we discover, like basically everyone should be treated um, equally or what, here's a good example. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That is a statement of natural law, right? Endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That comes from Aristotle. It doesn't come from Plato, okay? It comes from this sentence in Aristotle about natural law. And it doesn't depend on people thinking this or that, you know? The King of England might not think we have these rights, but we do because nature gave them to us, right? That's an Aristotelian idea. That's the idea of natural law. And that will become extremely, extremely important uh, on Friday and into next week when we talk about the Roman view of, of politics, okay? So I think we've covered everything for tonight, but tomorrow will be fun. I promise you, tomorrow is almost entirely about friendship and about how to be a good friend, how to make friends, how to keep friends, and what are friends for, who is a true friend, what the different types of friends. And I think it's really cool.